couldn't come in and, and her um her husband um did you know all the measures that we and we actually it, it, it worked well uh or decently i should say um but we've also had some trouble particularly with our researchers who are doing um pediatrics uh data collection and the rules around um, privacy and minors um so she basically had to put everything on hold and still has it on hold because their RUW policy is no Zoom with minors under 13. Wow. Age 13. So, you know, and right now they're not budging on that. So, so that's unfortunate. So just be aware that that could be an issue for your um, researchers that are doing pediatrics work, that there may be um, some regulations around that. And then lastly with animal work, because half of my studies are animal work and we have a few other labs as well. Um, we uh, stopped all work with colonies in March, and um, fortunately now we're able to resume those again. But things have had to be different. There, uh, we have altered the the study endpoints or procedures that require people to stand very close to each other. So two people working with animals next to each other, all of that has been changed, and we've made it so really it's just one person there working with an animal at a time. So. Um, that's all that I wanted to share with you regarding the UW experience and um, you know we can have some questions now or we could uh, or we could go ahead and listen to whoever's next. How did you want to do that Debbie? Um, I don't know. Uh, let's have let's go ahead and have Jay do his presentation <laughs> okay. and then um, if you could unshare your screen yeah. and see if Jay can do it, and then maybe we can have a little bit more of a of yeah. an open mic thing. Jay, are you able to? Uh, I am good now. Yes, perfect. Excellent. So, um, <clears throat> you know, very similar experiences. Um, so it uh, makes me feel a little bit better that we're kind of going through the, the, the same thing uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, when they first um, uh, announced that we had to shut down, they uh, described three tiers of uh, research uh, that was all based on um, the level of benefit to uh, risk to the uh, participants. Um, and, you know, most of our research is in the tier two or three area. Uh, therefore, you know, uh, that was um, all uh, required us to shut um, all of our uh, clinical research down. So that happened at the end of March. Uh, we have a, a physical therapy clinical and translational research uh, center clinic. Uh, that is actually funded by the CTSI here at Pitt. Uh, so that had to be closed down within 24 hours. Um, we had to suspend all subject recruitment and in-person research uh, interventions and follow-ups. And all of our personnel transitioned to working from home. Uh, we did not have any problems with having to furlough uh, any uh, individuals and um, uh, fortunately, the funding agencies, um, you know, uh, allowed us to continue to, to support those personnel while they were uh, working from home. And, and we worked hard to make sure that our research personnel were uh, productive um, while working from, from home. Um, and our out, a lot of the work I do ties into our outpatient sports medicine clinic. So uh, those uh, clinical visits, uh, which were used for research follow-ups and the surgeries that, that we're randomizing subjects to were uh, ramped down and converted to telemedicine. Um, and uh, the clinical side actually started to open up here in Pittsburgh in late April. Um, so the clinical visits and uh, non-essential surgery uh, gradually uh, resumed. I think one thing we learned as a medical center is we're, they don't really want to call anything non-essential anymore. Um, uh, you know, just with the connotation there and and um, you know how uh, it was um, affected through this uh, process. 
um, uh, we did not have to submit any uh, IRB modifications, but what the IRB wanted was uh, us to submit exceptions or essentially a note uh, to the IRB. And uh, we did that to permit uh, remote uh, research interventions and follow up to allow our research personnel to contact subjects by phone to get data and um, to uh, permit out of window clinical and research visits without them being having to be recorded as a um, as a uh, protocol deviation. Um, our uh, resumption of clinical research activities uh, was uh, the procedures for that uh, was announced um, at the beginning of June, which coincided, coincided with us moving to the green phase. Um, the underlying assumptions is that safety is paramount for all involved. Um, planning has to be grounded in science and guidance from the CDC, as well as from our uh, quality uh, center at the UPMC. Uh, clinical research is essential. That was an underlying tenet. So there was a, uh, a desire to, to get that restarted, that it had to go in the phased approach, much like uh, Beth talked about. Um, even though we are resuming um, in-person research activities, uh, an underlying tenet is that work that can be performed remotely should continue to uh, be done remotely. And we also had to be prepared for setbacks and to quick, quickly ramp down our research if that became necessary. Mm. So uh, much like Beth talked about, we had to create a uh, research restart plan. Um, it was a lengthy document and the template was provided by the uh, university that had to be reviewed and approved at the department level and then the school level. And we also had to have our space uh, inspected. Mm -hmm. They didn't make so much of an issue with, um, uh, you know, management of uh, airflow. Um, the things that we had to deal with were um, reorganizing, rearranging equipment and furniture to ensure social distancing, making sure we had PPE and disinfecting supplies on hand. And they were really very big on uh, posting of signage that uh, reminded people to socially distance, use of face mask, hand cleaning, and uh, disinfecting equipment after it was used or touched. Um, so the components of our plan, uh, we pre-screen um, participants within 24 hours of the scheduled visit and again at arrival. And um, this is basically uh, what I think everybody would be familiar with, uh, reviewing the presence or absence of COVID related symptoms, whether they've had any exposures um, or they travel to, to high risk areas. Um, for our PT research clinic, we are also screening for uh, temperature, uh, but when our research subjects come into the clinic, uh, that is not being, uh, that is not part of the clinical protocol there. Mm -hmm. um, we had to, uh, and we're not doing any COVID uh, testing um, at all for our uh, subjects or, uh, or patients as, you know, in, in that aspect uh, either. Um, we had to reorganize uh, equipment and space. Um, and um, we really uh, worked hard at uh, changing our scheduling so that essentially when a patient arrives, they sit in the car, they call us, we go through the screening questions. If they pass, we meet them at the front door, take the temperature, if they pass that, then they're escorted up to the clinic and treatment begins immediately. We don't have them uh, sitting in a waiting room. Um, and then we are certainly limiting the number of subjects uh, at any one time, which really isn't that big of a problem right now because our, um, Research clinic is about almost 5,000 square feet, so uh, we can space people out uh, pretty well. Um, the PPE, uh, we have, we're following the CDC and the Wolf Center, which is our, our quality center uh, guidelines. And uh, this has been a little bit 
uh, you know, uh, uh, change over time. Uh, at the minimum, um, a surgical mask is worn by um, all research staff and subjects at all times. Um, eye protection, um, either in the form of uh, goggles or a face shield is used if there's, um, uh, if you're gonna be within six uh, feet of the individual or there's direct contact with the subject. Um, interesting uh, for, uh, we're required to use N95 face mask if there's gonna be any aerosolizing uh, procedures. And it is uh, important to note that uh, moderate aerobic exercise, such as walking um, on a treadmill or riding an ergometer, uh, was deemed to be an aerosizing uh, procedure. And uh, to do this, we would require N95 face masks. The problem is uh, we cannot get N95 face masks. So that basically means uh, that this component of our intervention uh, really can't be delivered. Uh, right now, uh, which is a big deal for uh, one of our Parkinson's uh, studies. You know, obviously frequent hand cleaning before and after contact with the patient, uh, cleaning and disinfecting the surfaces before and after use, including keyboards and uh, tablet computers. And when possible, we have the patients use their own devices to complete the uh, surveys and patient reported outcome measures that we use. Um, education was uh, critical and there were training that was specified by the university, by the quality center and um, lab specific training. Um, we do daily attestations um, uh, that are completed by the research staff. So again, uh, screening, time in, time out, um, individuals that they were in contact with for greater than five minutes within um, six feet. Uh, this right now is uh, paper-based. Um, at our sports medicine clinic, that is now converted to using um, a QR code that you can screen on your um, cell phone and then answer that information directly there. Uh, within our School of Health and Rehab Sciences, we're gonna be moving to that in, a, in the very near um, future. Um, we do keep a clinic log for uh, all personnel and subjects that include time in, time out, so that we can do contact tracing if, uh, if necessary. And um, the work schedule, again, we've modified it to um, include only those individuals that are necessary to, to be there to perform the in-person research activities. And in doing that, we consider, you know, making sure that um, we're staying within the social distancing guidelines. Um, we only include the, those qualified staff that are needed. And we also have to respect the health uh, and uh, age of our research staff. We did have some uh, research staff that were a little bit uh, older and actually had some health uh, conditions. And um, uh, we've not been incorporating those uh, in the in-person research activities. Um, we also generated some patient facing materials, essentially a letter um, that is given to all the participants to welcome them and thank them for participating in our research to advise them of the screening and, ar and arrival uh, procedure. Um, we also had to complete a survey to our IRB. Um, they had to uh, approve our resumption of the activities for each uh, study. And basically we had to answer these three questions. Why can't enrollment be postponed until restrictions are lifted? What's the harm to the subject or the value of data lost if in-person visits are not resumed? And what measures are you taking to minimize in-person uh, visits? And um, this was just submitted as a comment to the IRB. It was not a formal uh, modification. So it was actually a fairly uh, simple process. And typically, uh, we had the response from the IRB within um, no more than three days. Uh, when, we, when I'm doing the research in the UPMC uh, clinics, um, we are essentially following the UPMC uh, clinical guidelines um, and um, uh, 
you know, that's where we do our screening, recruitment, and consent. Um, uh, our interventions that are standard of care are done there, uh, as well as our clinical follow-up and some of our uh, research follow-up uh, activities. Um, and the key there is, again, we had to limit our research assistance in the clinic for recruitment and research. Typically, I have a staff of uh, three uh, clinical research assistants that are present in the building on a daily basis. I can only have one of those there um, at a time um, right now. Uh, something that was interesting uh, uh, and very uh, appreciated is the university uh, made a decision early on for those in the uh, tenure stream uh, that they, uh, upon request from the faculty member, they would grant a uh, one-year uh, temporary type E transfer out of the uh, tenure stream, and that was given to, to all faculty that uh, requested that and we had at least one we had one faculty member um, take advantage um, of that uh, so where are we heading now uh, we are now um, getting out of the emergency uh, operating plan but uh, and moving to what uh, Pitt is calling the pit resilience plan which will have three levels of risk high elevated and guarded um, we just moved into the elevated risk uh, period uh, last week. And, uh, you know, each of those uh, uh, risk levels is associated with a certain level of research that, that can be done. And the idea is that, you know, we need to be nimble and flexible and may move from one risk level to the next um, based on what's happening on the ground here. Uh, in, in the region, and we need to be prepared to adjust our research um, accordingly. So that's kind of our experience uh, that, uh, that uh, we've gone through, and happy to talk about that in greater detail and understand um, you know, how things are going in, in other programs. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jay. That was really uh, very detailed as, and um, I think many of us <clears throat> have similar, um, have found similar policies in our research intensive universities, but that was very thorough. Um, I saw a question from Carrie uh, Dunning about, um, Carrie Dunning is asking about N95 masks deemed necessary for patients and treating therapists while patient is on treadmill or only for the patient? Um, it would be both depending on how close that uh, therapist is in, in contact with them. If they're within, you know, if they're providing kind of standby contact and, and uh, monitoring vital signs or something like that, the therapist would, would need to um, have the appropriate uh, protection as well. Thanks. And just to make sure, it's the IRB that deemed it an aerosoling activity? No, actually it was, uh, so that's the other thing is uh, um, a lot of these uh, uh, guidelines were established by um, environmental health and safety. Uh, so they were the ones that were, uh, you know, providing the, the, the recommendations uh, together with the U uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center uh, uh, quality uh, center. Uh, so it was kind of a joint, uh, effort. It's really hard to separate uh, Pitt and, and UPMC. It's a close working relationship. Thank you. So this is Sandy at KU Med Center. So, you know, um, we are doing uh, an exercise trial with one of Carrie's faculty, our hit stroke trial, and uh, we've been able to continue with exercise. Um, so we actually don't need to mask them. They'll let us do it without wearing uh, a mask, but we have to actually wait like until the droplets settle, if there could mm. be any out there. <laughs> and then we have to undergo a really rigorous um, cleaning procedure after that 30 minutes, wiping almost everything down. We only have one participant. You know, we still have many trials going now. It's only one person exercising at a, at a time. 
Um, but the therapists have a face shield on, a face mask, um, and then our university provides all the cleaning and, and PPE for that. Um, we just decided at a good practice to go ahead and make our participants wear a very flexible, disposable um, face shield that we actually, we keep all their stuff in a little um, brown paper bag that we just keep uh, their face mask and everything uh, in as, as well. So, so far, everybody's felt very comfortable. The participants were really excited to come back. And so far, KU hasn't had any within um, like participant transmission across all studies. So that's been good too. So I just thought I'd share that for the group. Yeah, and something that we've talked about. So this is the Pierce Boyne. This is the study that um, Sandy's a co-investigator on. Um, it's a multi-site study. And so we really looked at a lot of different masks and we actually tried N95 masks and felt like we couldn't even exercise in them. They're very effective. And so I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that, how uh, someone with uh, a stroke or people, someone with Parkinson's or anyone I, would be able to exercise moderately or vigorously with an N95 mask on their face safely. I don't think that's recommended with the literature we looked at. Yeah, and we haven't been able to get them, so we have no experience with it. We, it, it essentially causes us to suspend that activity. It's actually why we went ahead and went along with the the COVID nasal swab testing, even though, you know, that added a whole nother layer um, because we just wanted to do the VO2 max tests and we wanted to be able to do other maximal tests and not have to have them wearing masks. So. Yeah. So another uh, question that's come up and, and it's kind of good to also talk about other settings. So um, Terry Ellis is asking whether or not that you've sent anybody sent research staff members to patients' homes to collect data um, using appropriate screening and PPE. We've not uh, done that. Anybody else in the? This doesn't just have to be the um, featured speakers. Do, has anybody in the audience had any experience with um, home visits? We have not either. We do have two studies that need to do that. Um, and we have not been given an option to submit a proposal for that yet. Um, we were hoping that in August it would open up that we could submit a proposal to go back into patients' homes. But with our number of cases increasing in Cincinnati now, I don't know if that's going to be possible, but um, we were told that once things stabilize in August, we would be able to submit a proposal to go into people's homes. I don't know where that's going to go now. Yeah, the, the same at Utah for a few of these studies. We can't go into homes. So uh, anything we do, we have to try to convert to essentially televisits. Uh, obviously some things we can't do, but we're all getting a little creative with this. So, but right now we're not allowed to do uh, any home visits at all for, for subject data collection. Is anybody doing inpatient um, acute care? Uh, yeah. Data collection? Uh, yeah. So we're starting. So the Jules Sewell, Northwestern University, so we have 10 large labs, and I'm only, only going to mention things that we haven't heard yet, because I think that Mary right. and Jay have done some uh, really nice, uh, gave us already a nice overview. So uh, I'll answer that question in a moment, but a few other things that also came to mind. We have generated an e-log system, so that if you want to get into a lab, you need a fob, and we have only so many people that can be in a lab depending on square footage. So we calculate the square footage per lap, make sure that you don't have 36 square foot, but 90 square foot per individual. Also take into account you have robots and devices that we use in a lot of our engineering oriented work. So to really make that uh, a, a much safer situation. So many labs, you only, may only have uh, three, four, five people at a time, okay, depending on the size of the lab. Um, for an another thing that we've done in a big city like Chicago is to prevent participants to take um, public transportation, which is obviously <laughs> dicey right now, we actually have come up with a Lyft contract. So we have a contract with Lyft, not Uber, but Lyft gave us a much better deal. So that basically folks are picked up at their home and brought to the front door. And then we do very, things very similar to what Jay already mentioned. We pick them up right there. 
bring them into our labs, et cetera, so that in, in essence, they have a lot less exposure by having a lift ride as opposed to having to take public transportation. Um, with regard to clinical trials, we tried to go to people's home, but basically ran into the same obstacles that many of you mentioned that didn't work uh, very well. But clinical trials within our uh, department now are slowly getting up and running again. With regard to the acute work, we've got two large R01s uh, funded uh, uh, before COVID. And actually that's been an opportunity where things are up and running more quickly because folks that have, for instance, have a stroke go to the hospital anyways. And so then us doing measurements while they're there actually has been easier than having people come to your facility or to your campus. So it actually has been an advantage for us to get that up and running. Uh, so that is now starting to, uh, to get, uh, get rolling. Let's see what else do I have. Also, like uh, Jay mentioned, everybody got automatically a one year extension on their tenure track. You didn't even have to fill out any paperwork. It was done across the board for everybody. Um, we have some issues in the city of Chicago, and I'm, I'm really interested to hear from, from all of you, where we can only have 25% occupancy in buildings. So that means research, places, et cetera. So whether you're teaching or whether you do research, you have limitations as to how many people can be there at one time. Also, whenever you go to campus, we have to fill out paperwork. Every day you go, you have to fill it out to make certain that uh, and you have to kind of fill out boxes that you don't, you're not sick, you have no temperature, all of those things before you're allowed to get to campus. And the FOP system that I was talking about allows us then to also see where people have been during the day. So if somebody's infected, we can backtrack where they have been and with whom they have been in contact so that we can contain things as much as possible. With regard to masks, we have done across the board surgical masks. Uh, they, in, in our research, that has shown to be the next best uh, thing uh, the, in, with regard to your comments, uh, Jay. And that has worked reasonably well, even with some of our early work in the lab uh, with regard to uh, gate work, like full gate labs, et cetera. So that's, I wanted to quickly mention some things that weren't mentioned yet to add that to uh, what we have heard already. Thank you. Anybody else had trouble with the minors and telemedicine and collecting data in pediatrics? Any other centers dealing with that? In our area, we've sent out um, uh, iPads and the parent will actually videotape the child doing whatever they were supposed to be doing and would have been coming into the clinic to do. And they like it because they don't have to transport them downtown. They, and since our students are going to be coding them anyway, based on what they do during that activity, it works out okay. Good, so no no regulations about minors. Well, they're not on Zoom though, they're being filmed. They're not, it's, yeah. just, a fa it's just transferring yeah. that, okay. yeah. So, um, Deepak has asked, has anyone, had experience moving some of their motion capture um, from the lab to the clinic, uh, like an inertial most motion capture for studies where interventions are being delivered as part of the standard of care uh, and clinical care. I think I, hopefully I said that, um, what you're asking, Deepak. Okay. We haven't done, I mean, we can do, um, you know, our research follow-ups in the clinic using the clinic space. Um, we have to be sensitive to what's going on in the clinic and respect social distancing. And we kind of need to, to schedule that to make sure that they're not exceeding the capabilities of the clinic. Uh, but we, it, it's not requiring any sophisticated equipment that we have to uh, transfer uh, into the into the clinic. It's just a matter of coordinating the uh, the need to use the space with the clinic direct with the clinic managers uh, to make sure that uh, we're not exceeding the capabilities of the clinic. Thanks. I was actually wondering, outside of the logistical challenges, uh, if how those uh, proposal have been received by your leadership at different institutions, like have have they have the leadership been uh, willing to let that happen? Like, trust yeah, uh, that we included that actually in our uh, research startup plan and there were no problems. Um, 
you know, I communicated with the a clinic director to let him know uh, what our plans were, and um, they didn't have a problem uh, but with that. You have clinics. You're talking about clinics that belong to your university. Deepak, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. talking about uh, private or non. Uh, Academic clinics, so okay. universities that belong to the university. Clinics that okay, so you're not, because sometimes I know it gets tricky when you go outside your own university. Yeah. Um, Jim Gordon's wondering about subject recruitment. How how have people been impacted on their numbers and things like that? Well, I can say that it has not been good, uh, Jim, <laughs> because clinical trials had to be at a standstill starting. Uh, March and uh, basically are only now slowly uh, going again um, and uh, even at a reduced uh, rate. Uh, the good thing is that NIH has allowed us to uh, to kind of transform money like a no-cost extension much earlier in the year which I recommend people consider. So if you don't use your funds you can kind of ask for a mid-year no-cost extension. You don't want to wait all the way to the end of the year. So keep that in mind. So that's something that one can do. And otherwise, as I think uh, Jay mentioned for sure, um, NIH has been continuing to pay folks. Uh, it has been hard for our D PhD students to uh, remain active. And uh, for the type of work that we do, which is a bit more engineering-like, we allow folks to do all kinds of simulations at home with the data that they may have acquired a while ago. But at a certain point, you run out of doing that as well. So the good thing is we're now slowly getting started, but it's we're not anywhere near the levels we were at prior to uh, to COVID, so, yeah. And Jim, this is yeah. Rich Souza over at UCSF. I <clears throat> wrote it in the chat, but I was just gonna say that we've actually been very surprised at how um, open people are returning to the laboratory. We have a lot of the same restrictions that have been spoken about previously, but what we, our loss to follow up is pretty similar to what we were seeing pre-COVID, which is not a great number to begin with, but um, no, no, no additional ones. Uh, the big problem we're having is, is, you know, being kind of ortho sports, uh, we've got an ACL trial right now. There's no ACL injuries. Um, you know, until individuals get back to playing sports, we're pretty much out of luck. Maybe we shouldn't do any sports anymore, Jay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Put me out of business. Has anyone looked at, um, like, if you're doing arterial spin labeling uh, or any things in the MRI with um, wearing masks, so we've, or some of our partners have done some studies and wearing a mask, it increases the CO2 uh, by about 10 millimeters of mercury. And so uh, in some of our measures where we do brain blood flow with transcranial Doppler, we don't have them have a mask on for those reasons. And so the MRI unit followed suit just to make sure and follow-ups that we weren't uh, creating increases in blood flow. And I wondered if anybody has looked at that in the scanner or even looked to see if blood flow changes with wearing a mask. Sounds like a good study. <laughs> I know. I wonder if I could get COVID, a COVID supplement. I wonder if I could get a COVID supplement for that. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so actually, uh, Sandy, I have a, um, yeah. a, a, a colleague in my department uh, with an undergrad in physics and a PhD in, in neural, uh, neuroimaging who is studying blood gases and all of that. And her name is Molly Bright. And what I'll do is uh, make sure that you, the two of you get to, to talk because that's her research. It goes into great depth in, in changing blood vascularization based on, mm -hmm. on blood gases. And she would be the person yeah. to be able to answer your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Wendy Huddleston has a comment saying in their fMRI, um, they're not able to have their participants wear masks. Yeah, they do. They, uh, in our scanner, they, I think they allow for about 45 minutes. So, it, you know, that really creates a challenge with uh, imaging and we're really backed up and they've started opening Saturdays because um, they clean, it takes them 45 minutes to clean everything in between participants. So that's, that's been a real, a real struggle. Everybody tries to sign up early for the scanner. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. <clears throat> I might just want to raise something uh, here. I'm Jim Gordon from USC. Here at USC, there's been a lot of discussion about what people uh, call sometimes a pivot the concept of, of pivoting your research to be 
ready for the conditions that we're going to face over the next year or maybe more. And that is, that is to say to start to reduce the, uh, the, or the relative weight of, you know, patients coming in and, and moving to more, uh, you know, telehealth approaches and things of that sort. Uh, it's tough for us because we're, you know, we're very sort of movement oriented and clinically oriented, but still I'm interested in, in whether people are having these discussions or whether this is part of the, the lingo elsewhere. Yeah, like for our research, uh, Jim, we are, for new projects, we are essentially building in contingency plans. So depending on the status at any given time, we want to be able to, as you say, pivot to a strategy where we can keep collecting our core measures without uh, like, uh, like keeping our, uh, meeting the study aims. So we are planning for scenarios where there's a complete lockdown versus the clinic is open, but the lab is shut down versus if, if, like if both places are open, things like that. Uh, so we're building in those contingency scenarios into our new studies. Um, one of the aspects has been, of course, like moving more towards tele assessments, but then also trying to see uh, how much of the interventions can be delivered online as well. Yeah, this we, in Cincinnati, we're, the, we're doing the same thing. We have, I think, three intervention studies in my department that have already moved to virtual moving forward because they were able to. Um, so, but, but every, I think we're all thinking about that. Like, how can we be more virtual in the future? I know I have a multi-site trial where, um, we're talking, we were doing assessments in the home and we're talking about, well, how are we going to do that now? What's possible? What does research show? Um, what's valid? So we're actively having those discussions all the time on doing as much virtual as we can in all our studies. There's some indications, and I'm, uh, I'm just getting different reports on this, that uh, NIH might look more favorably on proposals that build in these kind of contingencies and are not quite as dependent on, uh, you know, on the, uh, you know, patient visits to the lab, to the hospital, et cetera. So that is another uh, aspect of this that, uh, I think we need to be thinking about. Yeah, Sandy just piped in that it, her U19 submission required um, a COVID plan. So I guess that might be a good topic of discussion for um, another meeting is what are some of the creative strategies people have put in their COVID plans because, um, you know, there's some, some, of, some research, I mean, I mean you know, some you can do certain interventions virtually or data collection virtually, but others we may need some help thinking outside of the box for our stuff. Um, I just posted a guidance from NIH. They're, they're specifically asking not to put in contingency plans and reviewers are not supposed to take this into consideration. Yeah, yeah, and I would like to second that. I just came back from a review not that long ago and it's very specifically mentioned not to consider this at all. Now that may change, Jim. But currently, that's definitely the case. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So um, one question had to do with how are you handling your PhD dissertations? I know I was on a committee that, you know, the student had collected a couple of aims that were in pretty good shape that were salvageable, but, you know, we had to kind of let some of it go. But um, certainly he didn't have complete data on uh, some and I think we just decided well maybe we'd allow him to look at psychometric properties that maybe he hadn't was it didn't become a big focus of hadn't originally been a big focus but because he had some reliability data we let him look at some you know pivot, shift a name to talk more about that and you know he had some and then he planned to continue to collect and analyze the data past that but we didn't want to hold him up getting his faculty position and things like that. But um, other people have to have students who were just on the verge of finishing in spring and had to shut down their data collection or 
Yeah, I had I had a very similar experience, Deb, where we did essentially the same thing. She had analyzed most of her data, but there was some videotape that she was going to analyze, and you know, all of a sudden she couldn't get in to see it and use the equipment, and we just sort of said, well, we'll take that part out, and uh, you'll come back to it. And that was the only reasonable thing to do instead of wait her make her wait some indeterminate amount of time when she was ready to defend in July, and she passed. So that's good. So at, at the University of Kentucky, so I'm, a, I'm the director of the PhD program for rehab sciences. And at the University of Kentucky, the university itself has put an emergency fund in place for those students who were going to graduate in the summer or the fall. And that's going to be reevaluated in case the spring has to be done the same, but that we're supposed to graduate and can't. And so that we're, and that we're on assistantship so that they won't lose their stipend in case uh, that assistantship had ended. And so um, in our program, we did not have any students who were in that position, but there were other students in other programs who were. And so at least they are not without money and without a degree. We took a different approach with one of my students. He proposed in March. He was the first virtual proposal we had, and it was a community-based uh, group physical activity program for people with strokes, which is not the right timing right now at all. And uh, he's pivoting and reproposing next month with a new project. So um, we have a few more minutes. Um, what are the kinds of topics or other things? How can RIP serve you <laughs> through this um, through this pandemic? <laughs> because um, we want to be the place where um, we can come together and help each other solve these things. Um, we have a web page. We could, if people have. Um, any kind of manuals or if you want to help us service some sort of clearinghouse. I mean, you know, we don't want to share things that uh, you feel will be inappropriate, but um, how can our leadership uh, and consortium uh, serve you with this, you, you know, topical meetings like today was just a little pretty broad, but um, uh, uh, you can either put stuff on the chat now, or you can email me personally. You all should have my email address from sending out the invitation. Um, Cause this is, this is the place for us to uh, help each other. Debbie, I think it would be nice if, if folks who haven't put together a, their long, I think I, it's, I heard from everybody that when they have done a COVID plan for their lab, it's really long, um, that a lot of that duplication of work could be avoided if you know, people would share some of those templates. So I'm happy to share the one that we're using um, at our, in our program. If, you know, if anybody's sitting down to write that, it's all a lot of the same stuff. Now, obviously your university will have different requirements, but mm -hmm. a lot of it's the same. So if that would be helpful, we could have a place on the website maybe where those links are or you know or, or whatever just a thought yeah, i think it's an excellent idea it makes a lot of sense john yeah. do you think base camp's appropriate for that or to be a little more private or do you think the website's better um i was wondering about the same thing because you know your university legal counsel might not be as excited as you are right. yeah. sharing your covid reopening plans uh, um, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. you're right but, uh, at least base camp is um you know it's a membership based thing yeah. so that you can kind of control who gets in there um or you could sort of generalize it to say something along the lines of we suggested that patients put on their own markers um you know or the sort of the key tricks tricks and and uh tips um rather than sharing that legal document by might be another approach Beth, I was told that we just had to put draft across it and keep it in draft mode and not suggest that it's the final. So that, right. you know, that way it could be modified, but you might want to check with them. They just asked because we had shared with some others that um, 
which um, I see Patty's joined and she can share if she so chooses because um, we share lab space. So I'm happy to to do that if she want if she chooses. But um, but yeah, we just had to put draft on there and we could share that. Well, either way, I mean, you know, Rip would be happy. I mean, a captor's happy to support whichever thing you guys think it'd be easier to use. It's no skin of our teeth. Yeah, you know, on the one hand, if we put it on ripped, it's potentially Googling, you know, people could Google and I don't, you know, where's base camp is a little more. Uh, that's, that's true. Yeah. So, um, I, I'm not, you know, base camp is nice, but it's also just another thing you have to like, oh, I have to remember that, get that username and password. But I mean, it might be useful to try and put together kind of a running document, um, kind of like what has been done for reopening education mm -hmm. where you know suggestions tricks to the trade that kind of thing jules is ideal about you know paying for a lift um mm -hmm. great idea those kinds of things they're like oh that's a good idea you know if we could share more widely you know and just the fact i my study coordinator typed out a really nice patient um brochure that that talks the patient and their helper whoever the helper is going to be how to do a six minute walk test exactly the way we want it done, you know? And so we didn't lose that endpoint on a couple of people that couldn't come back. And same thing with wall squat tests and a few other things. So I don't know, that kind of stuff, it just takes time to write it all out. So if we, you know, people are willing to share those things, it's nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and not, and another thing we may want to consider is shared data if that's possible at all. If we have PhD students that are working on things, you have some data that would be useful for the, for the type of work that they do, that they can do things with it. Um, depending on their background, they could do some interesting modeling work on, on data that you collected in your lab. I think there too, we need to be a lot more collaborative in that regard. That's why we have an organization like uh, RIPS, is so we can collaborate. And so I think we should, we should push that a, a lot more. Uh, why not help each other out? We're all going through a tough time and we may have different data sets that may be very complementary and help our PSD students out. So I think that that's another thing we should really consider. Okay, so uh, the next RIPT meeting would normally, it would be in October, is that soon enough for everybody for us to have a membership meeting that would help us talk about, um, say, have a topic like, I don't know, COVID uh, strategies for, uh, but to me, that seems like we're gonna be in the middle of things, but on the other hand, we all have extremely busy lives already <laughs> but uh but um you know if we if we, you know we talked about mechanisms to get what we already have on the website but is october soon enough to talk about at our membership meeting um alternatives for reese for doing things live because <laughs> we'll already be in the middle of another big mess i'm sure yeah I mean, this is Sujay here. I think it's a reasonable timeline. And uh, as it was mentioned before, I know we had a new kind of tele-rehab, telemedicine kind of a framework. It might be nice to have a session on that if it's uh, something everybody's interested in, because I think a lot of research is going to pivot in that area. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the first council is that we do have a section on tele-rehab and uh, telemedicine. We can ask some of them to join us as guests to give some ideas. That's good. Yeah, and, and maybe adding uh, to that a bit, um, also app development to collect data. One of my faculty members does a lot of pediatric work, really early work, and she has been developing these apps that actually is like a major search now because that's something that's all possible and it becomes now very popular to do. So I think that's, uh, that's a, you could call it a form of tele, but it's uh, much more app specific and allows you to collect data on early movement disorders in kids, for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it sounds like we have a lot of good things. I'm going to take a, I don't know if you can take a screenshot of my <laughs> chat in case I lose this, but um, I did record the meeting. I lost a little bit of uh, Beth's, uh, I didn't get you right at the beginning. So if you'll send me your slides, Beth, um, and then we'll try to link also a recording of this meeting at for sure at this beginning to, um, to the, our webpage for those who wanted. 
Um, but I uh, really, really thank, I mean, having 50 people turn out, this has been an excellent turnout and I'm glad to see such enthusiasm. And uh, like I said, it, this would be great if RIP could um, serve as a clearinghouse and place for everybody to come together and support each other, so. Okay. And as I said, it shouldn't, I think Zoom can handle what, 500 people? And that'd be an awesome <laughs> thing if we had 500 people. <laughs> in our meetings. So everybody uh, stay sane and stay healthy. Yes, Scott, Scott said stay healthy. I'm thank hoping you. to stay sane as well. So <laughs> thank you. Right. Beth, well, thank you, Jay, for um, Bye. Bye. And Goodbye, good everybody. to see everybody. <laughs> thank you. Everyone. See you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.